Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about just some basic cardiopulmonary rehab exam and assessment procedures. Uh, this isn't necessarily a all-encompassing comprehensive review of assessment procedures in cardiopulmonary rehab. It's just a quick walkthrough, uh, just giving you some of the basics. A lot, a lot of this stuff is developed uh, on the job, I hate to say, because a lot of it comes down to clinical reasoning. But at a very basic level, we're going to talk about data collection and data interpretation in assessment. So basically, we need to do all of these things, or we need to consider all of these things in the management of a patient. Uh, kind of the very first step is to gather clinical data, and that's examination. Examination is measuring the vitals, taking a range of motion, getting an activity tolerance test on paper. Evaluation is interpreting all of those things to guide your treatment and to guide your plan of care. So two very different things. One is data collection, one is clinical reasoning. Then we have diagnosis. PTs don't uh, medically diagnose patients. So you're never going to do a test and say, you know what, uh, it looks like you have, I'm looking at your ECG here and it looks like you have a STEMI, an ST elevated myocardial infarction. No, you would never do that. But you would gather data, interpret it, and diagnose what the patient's uh, cluster of impairments is so that you can have a better understanding of what you need to do with that patient. Um, sometimes that takes a form of what's called a treatment diagnosis. That's not done as much anymore in Medicare, but it used to be that the physician would do a medical diagnosis and the PT would do a treatment diagnosis. That's not done for Medicare, which probably means it's not done for any of the insurers anymore, but we still need to make that unofficial treatment diagnosis, at least in our brain. We need to say, oh, this is a patient that has, um, stable angina and I need to, I need to focus on their activity tolerance and I need to progress that. So it's kind of a mental diagnosis, not a real diagnosis. And then based on all of that data, you can kind of make a mental prognosis as well. You know, you say to yourself, okay, this is, there's a pretty good rehab potential here. If we just stick to the plan, if we push them at this pace, set these goals, I think we can, I think we can accomplish this. And actually you, you are typically putting a prognosis on a medical chart. Um, a prognosis can be excellent, good, fair, poor, or guarded. Uh, sometimes poor and guarded are used interchangeably. I won't ask you about that on a quiz, um, but you will see that out in the field once you graduate. Based on all this information, you need to put an intervention plan together and you need to come up with ways to measure the effectiveness of the intervention. And if the interventions aren't effective, you need to change them or discharge the patient. So we're gonna go through um, a variety of different things that fit into those categories. Uh, the first is just a chart review uh, and you're just trying to get a feel for the patient's history. The, anytime before you go into a patient's room or a patient's house in home health, if you're doing home health or a room, if you're in the hospital or skilled nursing, you need to read their chart. Uh, I have seen, I hate to say it, but I have seen people walk into homes and walk into rooms and say, uh, what, you know, what am I here for today? Tell me, tell me what's going on. And, you know, I'm guilty of occasionally a little bit of that. Um, I've never walked into a home completely blind. But sometimes the chart doesn't paint the whole picture. So I'll say to a patient, uh, and this is more for the next slide, but I'll say to the patient, so tell me a little bit about what happened to you uh, after you were discharged on the 10th. What was it like when you got home? Have you, what have you been struggling with? It's okay to ask open-ended questions like that, but you don't want to just know nothing <laughs> about the patient. The patient can tell very quickly. So here's a list of things you would want to review uh, before you see a patient. Um, whatever happened to cause the hospitalization, when did it happen and what was it? 
So that, that that tells you a lot about what you're what to expect about the patient. It also makes you look informed when you say, "Hey, I, I saw you had a, a you know an MI, a myocardial infarction on the twelfth, and you had a stent placed on the fourteenth, uh, and that you got home on the on the twentieth. How has it been since you got home two days ago? Tell me a little bit about that. So that just makes you look like, wow, this person, and it's true, you you've taken the time to learn about the patient." What were the symptoms at at admission? What other relevant medical history is there? Is the patient diabetic? Is there cancer? Dialysis? What else is going on besides the primary diagnosis? What meds is the patient taking? This is huge. This is a great way to prevent rehospitalization is to make sure uh, that the patient isn't prescribed duplicate medications or medications that interact. Most charts will now screen for this, most digital charts. Uh, so hopefully, you know, it's, it's not your job to check the physician's work, but mistakes are made. Um, and if you have an EMR that, that scans for that, or if you can recognize that the patient's on four different blood pressure medications, you could save a life. So you have to be careful not to step out of your scope of practice, but you don't want to completely turn a blind eye either to medications. Also, it's going to tell you what to expect. You know, if, if the patient's on blood pressure medication and you walk in and their blood pressure is super high, you say, hey, did you take your blood pressure medication today? No, I didn't. Okay. Well, so you're probably not going to do any real serious exercise or even activity tolerance assessment with that patient. So you need, you need to be aware of what's going on. It's not just walk in, do exercise with everybody. What risk factors does the patient have? Uh, Relevant lab data. Uh, This could be any number of things. Lipid panel. um, You could look at what their their oxygen saturation typically runs, that sort of thing. Are they on oxygen? Uh, If so, you need to make sure the patient is taking the correct amount when you're doing your activity. If it says they're on oxygen, and then they're not on oxygen and their oxygen saturation is low, that's a problem. If you start doing exercise with that patient and they desat and fall and hit their head, that's on you. That's your fault because the patient should have not done that activity without their prescribed oxygen. What surgical procedures were performed? Uh, This will give you some ideas about what to expect when you walk in, but also if there's any precautions. If they had open heart surgery, and there's going to be precautions associated with that uh, as far as lifting things overhead and and bearing down and how much weight they can lift. And that's something that you should look up and be aware of before you see the patient. ECG, um, I mean, it it depends on the setting. If you're like in a cardiopulmonary rehab clinic, yeah, of course, you want to know what the ECG looks like so you can be looking for aberrations while you're exercising. Typically, PTs aren't letting ECG guide their practice very much because in most settings they're not going to see the ECG when they're doing their activity. But in a cardiopulmonary rehab setting, uh, yeah, you would. Um, Blood gases, pulmonary function tests, other tests, vital signs, these are all relevant and can guide your practice, especially vital signs. And then you might want to review what the hospital course was like. Was it complicated with a lot of relapses and trouble? Or did it go pretty smooth? That's going to affect how aggressive you are with the patient. Uh, Then it's time to interview the patient. You get so much out of a patient interview. This is definitely not something to be glossed over at all. Um, It's important to ask somewhat open-ended questions. I don't mean, hey, how's it going? Tell me everything. But it's, it's nice sometimes to get the patient talking a little bit. You have to know when that's important and when you need to get straight to the point. Uh, so, you know, you could say something like, what did it, uh, what, what was the discomfort feel like when you were, when you were admitted to the hospital? Okay. And that might give you a sense of, you know, what happened? Oh, I was dizzy and, uh, and this happened and that happened, or I had this really severe pain in my chest and now that's gone. So it gives you a sense of where the patient was and where they are at now. Or you might want to ask really specific questions um, like, does your pain come on at a certain activity level? Yes. When I, when I go upstairs, it starts to hurt. Okay. 
That's a specific answer to a specific question. And there's a good table, uh, 16.2 on page 512, that goes through differentiation between angina and non-anginal pain. And so those are kind of examples of specific questions you might want to ask the patient to differentiate between two different disorders. Um, or you might want to ask broader questions. Just depends on what you're going for and what part of your evaluation form you're filling out. You're also going to want to review systems. Uh, most documents that you fill out in a rehab setting are going to ask questions about each of these. Uh, if yours doesn't, it's you know, certainly something that you would want to add, although I, I've never worked anywhere that doesn't have a section for each of these systems. Cognitive and communication skills. Examples of that could include, is the patient alert? Are they oriented to person, place, time? Do they know their name? Do they know where they are? Do they know what year it is, what month it is, what day it is? Just because they don't know what day it is doesn't necessarily mean they're disoriented, but they are disoriented to time. So, you know, it's important to track this kind of stuff. That's going to guide your practice. If they're disoriented to everything, it's unreasonable to ask them to remember and do an exercise program on their own. They're going to need more guidance. They're going to need more support. Um, of course, you want to have a basic understanding of their cardiovascular and pulmonary situation. And a lot of that comes from the chart review, but it also comes from assessing the patient. What are their vital signs? What is their angina pain like? Do they have angina? At what level does it come on? You're going to want to do a musculoskeletal and neuromuscular exam uh, to determine can they even do the exercises that you're, you're wanting them to do? Do they even have the range of motion to do the things you're prescribing to them? So just because they're a cardiopulmonary patient doesn't mean you stop being a PT. You're still going to assess the musculoskeletal system, the integumentary system. You know, do they have venous insufficiency ulcers, arterial ulcers? Uh, that's going to guide what you do as well. I can't tell you, you know, how many times someone has a, a, a wound on their, their heel or their foot and, you know, a PT doesn't think to say, hey, we can't be doing all these standing exercises with that wound. We need to figure something else out. Uh, and then other systems, endocrine system, what's the patient's blood sugar, et cetera. There's, uh, there's other systems to, to assess that can guide your practice. That brings us to the physical exam uh, that consists of inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion. Uh, in cardiopulmonary, these are the two we probably do the least as a PT. Um, but, but certainly, uh, you know, reasonable. It's going to depend a lot on where you work. Uh, some settings have PTs, you know, functioning at the top of their license. Those PTs usually have advanced training. Uh, they take seminar courses and get certificates or are cardio specialists, and they'll be doing all this at a high level. Typically, we are not doing uh, immediate percussion and palpation, and a lot of times even auscultation. But I will encourage you, no matter what setting you're in, auscultation is a reasonable thing for PTs to do. Um, but absolutely, we're going to be doing a ton of activity evaluation and inspection. So we'll start with inspection. This is uh, this all comes from looking at the patient, just like it sounds. Inspection. So you know, first you want to you want to see what the general appearance of the patient is. Do they have discoloration of their extremities due to hypoxemia? Is there blueness in their in their hands? Um, you know, is do they do they look like they're in pain? So that comes from a lot of look, you know looking at their face. Do you see a lot of accessory muscle breathing in their face and neck? Uh, you know, look at their chest at rest. Do they have a large anterior posterior? Um, uh, you know, is their chest large in the anterior and posterior direction, meaning they have a barrel chest, which would indicate COPD. Uh, as they breathe, do you see movement of their stomach? Do you see uh, expansion of their rib cage, or do you see accessory muscle breathing and, and their their tightness in their neck and rapid breathing? Uh, you know, you certainly want to check their respiratory rate during this time, and you want to get good at doing so without the patient knowing. It's never a good idea to say, "Okay, I'm going to monitor your breathing for the next minute. Breathe normally," and then you watch them breathe. Just like you, the patient is focused on their breathing. They're not going to breathe normally. 
they're going to breathe however they think you want them to. So this is something you want to do without them being aware. Uh, how are they producing uh, sound? Are they able? Are they able to speak normally? Are they coughing? Are they producing sputum? That all gives you insight into their condition. What's going on with their extremities? Uh, do they have hemosiderin staining in their feet due to venous insufficiency? Do their do their legs look rust colored? Uh, do they have clubbing of the fingernails due to hypoxemia? There's a good p- picture in your book, actually. Let's see, page five nineteen. Uh, digital clubbing. They show pictures of what fingernails look like in people with hypoxemia due to heart failure or or any number of disorders, COPD. We're going to do auscultation. This will, we'll do this in lab, so we don't need to go into any great detail here, but I just like this picture to give you a sense of where the different lung lobes are so you know what you're listening to. Um, I'm sure Dr. Wilson will, will have something like this for us. I believe we're doing auscultation this week, actually. I could be wrong. It could be ECG, but, but either way, you're going to get this in lab. Uh, so we'll move on. You already heard what the different sounds sound like in, uh, I believe that was the ischemia lecture. So wheezes, rails, ronky, those types of things. Um, so stay tuned for more on that. Same with the heart. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for more on this as well. Or I just did want to show you a few different diagrams of auscultation sites. There is variation this one on the left here is is my favorite. I think it's the most realistic. You know, they say like over here on the right, it's like okay, you hear the aortic semilunar valve here. You hear the pulmonary semilunar valve right there. And the problem with this is number one, um, that's probably not true. But but number two, this this requires much more palpation and trying to figure out where you are. You know, how many times has your physician really found? this uh, this rib intercostal space between two and three. No, more likely they're just going to ballpark areas. They're shooting for right where that A is, but they might be a little to the left, a little above, right? So they're saying anywhere in this area is aorta, but if you start getting to midline, it becomes tough to differentiate between aorta and pulmonic or tricuspid and aortic. These are all valve names or mitral and aortic. If you're right, if you're right here, who knows what you're listening to, Right. So this just gives you a sense of where you want to put the stethoscope uh, to hear these different valves. And we'll be talking about normal heart sounds and abnormal heart sounds. We already did a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit more in lab. Percussion. Uh, percu- this, this picture here, if you look, um, you're placing your middle finger somewhere. You're lifting up all of your other fingers, and then you're tapping that middle finger and you're listening to the sound it produces. You did a bit of this in medical screening. Uh, I don't see PTs doing this too often, but that doesn't mean you should it. I mean, this is a tool you can add to your skill set for sure. Um, And so what you're listening for is appropriate sounds in appropriate areas. So you would expect to hear dullness or flatness over the liver, which is in red here. You'd hear a normal sound over the lungs, and then you'd hear like a hollow tympanic sound over the stomach. And so if you start to hear hollow sounds in places you shouldn't, like hyperinflated lungs maybe, or dull sounds in places you shouldn't, like the lungs, if you heard a dull sound in the lungs, that's something to be investigated, right? Is there a, is there a, a tumor in the lungs that sounds dull? Now, as PTs, we don't diagnose this, obviously, but this is a part of medical screening, um, you know, that you should you should have available to you uh, if you're concerned about something. This is really where PTs shine. This is our this is our main thing we do in cardiopulmonary rehab. We assess activity tolerance and we progress it. We don't just say, "Hey, run on a treadmill. Tell me how you feel." Well, that's part of it. We want to know how they feel. We want to know what their rating of perceived exertion is. Um, you know, so that's always good to have a RPE poster in your clinic. And so the patient can look at it and say, they can tell you how hard something is. It's a scale with different ratings. But we want to be more precise than that. We want to check heart rate. We want to check blood pressure. We want to take oxygen saturation. 
And then we also want to know how the patient feels, you know, uh, you know, can you rate this activity for me? Or, you know, look at their face. Are, are they really struggling? Is their accessory muscle breathing? Are they becoming hypoxemic? That's all stuff over here for symptoms. This is something you do pretty much right away after a, after a heart attack, if you can believe that. Uh, one to two days after a kind of typical myocardial infarction that's uncomplicated and the patient has, you know, a procedure done and they're, they've recovered, once they're starting to get out of bed, you want to do an activity toleration, activity evaluation. What's their heart rate, blood pressure, and O2 sat in bed? Have them sit up. Check it again. Have them stand. Check it again. Have them dress or feed. You know, name the activity. Name the activity of daily living they're doing and record this information. How is it with ambulation and how much ambulation? Now, you don't go straight to ambulation. You're monitoring the vitals to see if it's safe to progress to the next level. So let's talk a little bit about that. What does heart rate do in response to activity? Well, it should increase fairly linearly with um, exercise intensity or, or activity uh, intensity. Now, this is a graph showing exercise. So this, you know, you're not going to necessarily have someone run right after having a heart attack, right? But so you can see it's a pretty dramatic uptick in heart rate. But it's usually a little bit more linear for just normal activities. And you would expect that. You expect heart rate to go up with increasing intensity. How much it goes up depends on their fitness. If they're unfit, it's going to go up very fast, very high. If they're the same activity in a fit person will be more blunted and lower. They'll also recover faster. Someone who's in shape will recover faster than someone who's unfit. Uh, you might see a line more like this green line. You might see a blunted response in a patient who's on beta blockers too, not just well-trained people. And a lot of your patients will be on beta blockers. So a slow response is normal. It's important to keep in mind what their heart rate max is. You don't want to be anywhere close to someone's heart rate max if they've just had a myocardial infarction. A lot of times you might receive instructions from the physician on a heart rate range or a percentage of max. Uh, so that can guide your practice. But generally speaking, you want to start very slow, monitor for symptoms, and then progress the patient. These are some quick, uh, oops, I didn't mean to go for it. Some quick formulas, three different formulas here. 220 minus age is the oldest formula. In elderly patients, it's overly conservative. However, if someone just had a myocardial infarction, being overly conservative is okay. So in my opinion, this is more than appropriate in an acute setting to let this guide your practice. Think about it, though. If you're 90, that's going to make your max heart rate 130. And that's, you know, that's pretty conservative. So, um, but... But, you know, or you can use this, this more, uh, this formula that is less conservative and that's for men, you do 205 minus half their age or for women, 225 minus age. <clears throat> the setting you're in is going to help you determine which of these to pick in your personal philosophy. You know, are you trying to be more conservative or more aggressive? Um, in either case, in an acute setting, you don't, you know, falling a, a cardiac event, you don't want them to be close to their heart rate max. So if you get close to their heart rate max, you've gone too far in the activity evaluation. Okay. You need to back off a little bit, take it more slowly. What's an abnormal response? A very rapid rise in heart rate. So, I mean, this looks pretty rapid, right? But if you go from rest to max quickly, you're, you're that's abnormal. That's cause for concern. The patient needs to, to rest and you need to ev continue to evaluate their vitals and potentially uh, seek an advanced level of care, you know, above and beyond therapy. They may need to get a physician involved. Uh, or a very flat rate of rise. If you're doing more and more activity and they're breathing really hard and looking hypoxemic but their heart rate is still low, that's cause for concern. Or a decrease in heart rate in response to exercise is very uh, concerning. 
blood pressure. The normal response, let's go through the normal and abnormal blood pressure response to activity. So a normal response is increased systolic blood pressure with increased exertion. You increase the activity level, SBP goes up. You should not see a diastolic blood pressure increase. They used to say any increase was abnormal. Uh, now they say, um, you know, up to 10 is okay. And up to 10 millimeter mercury increase is okay. But still, if you see an increase, that just tells you this is not an optimal cardiovascular system. Okay, so you need to be cautious if you see that. Um, you might even see a drop in diastolic blood pressure, but probably only in younger, well-trained people. A drop in DBP for you know a typical cardiac patient would not be normal, especially if it's more than ten. That that would be cause for concern. Um, so so in that vein, abnormal responses would be hypertension or hypotension in response to the exercise, or no response. So we have going up really high or down really low is abnormal, or not changing at all is abnormal. You want a gradual increase in SBP with exercise. Uh, an increase of greater than 10 or a decrease greater than 10. Oh, let me rephrase this slightly differently. An increase greater than 10 of DBP is always abnormal. An increase is always abnormal greater than 10. A decrease of greater than 10 is abnormal in untrained individuals. In a superstar athlete, potentially you could see a drop greater than 10. But so just a slight differentiation there. Uh, any diastolic blood pressure elevation that continues in the recovery phase, so you've stopped exercising in a minute or two minutes or three minutes later, DBP is still elevated, five, six, seven, eight units, that would be abnormal. For oxygen saturation, any drop below normal with activity is considered abnormal. Normal is 95 to 100. Um, so, you know, someone might start exercising and drop to 93. That's not technically normal, but it's also not necessarily a huge cause for concern, especially if there's no symptoms, you know. But if it drops below 90, that's considered low, okay? So that's, you definitely want to back way off on your activity if it's dropping below 90. I've seen people in their 70s who were fairly functional, which, you know, always causes me to question the accuracy of my pulse oximeter. But regardless of what their symptoms are, if they're that low, that's cause for concern. We stop. We have them sit. We have them lay down. We make sure their oxygen is correct. We check. We recheck. We call the physician if it's not returning to normal. The physician will most likely tell you to increase oxygen or or get them into the ER if it's bad. Um, so so the, the pulse ox is a powerful tool. However, people can become a little obsessed with it. It can be panic attack inducing, and I've seen it cause hyperventilation when a patient is just obsessively checking their PaO2. And so you need to guard against that. You don't want to scare the patient with the pulse ox. This is a tool for you to make sure that they're tolerating activity well. Um, I don't know if any of you have anxiety issues like that, but I've, I've kind of struggled a little bit with, uh, I guess like panic attacks, not lately, more when I was a kid. And one of the things that happens with the panic attack and some people is you can have a tendency to start hyperventilating and that can make you feel dizzy, hypoxemic, and that just feeds into the fear cycle that something's wrong with you, um, you know, physiologically. And so, and people like that having a pulse ox and checking it and you see, oh, 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 it's 92. That's low. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And you start, and then it gets worse. Right. So you need to be, a, try to be a calming influence on those type of type of patients. Check it, take it off. Don't have them stare on it. Don't have them stare at the number and act accordingly. If it's low, have them lie down, uh, check it again. If that doesn't help, um, you know, you should be, you should be working on diaphragmatic breathing, pursed lip exhalation, check it again, call the physician, adjust the oxygen. If that's the instruction, check it again. And then once it's fine, uh, you can check it a couple more times and then, and then, uh, you know, 
depending on what the physician orders were, act accordingly. Uh, either continue your treatment or not, depending on what you've discussed and what your clinical judgment is. And that's it, everybody. So kind of a short uh, video, but I think um, pretty fairly practical. Uh, when you get out into the world to do PT here, you are going to be performing all of these activities. You're going to be managing patients. So you need, to, you need to have a basic, reasonable level of medical screening capacity and systems review knowledge, and you need to be able to examine and evaluate the patient and act accordingly. So uh, with that, we'll wrap up. I think this will be a fun week in, in lab. We'll be able to put some of these skills into practice. Take care, everybody.